example, and on the right hand side is the response from the system. We'll detail that in a moment. The next screen, hidden behind her left shoulder there, is a copy screen of all of the other screens in the control room. Because Sue is a supervisor, she can look at anybody else's screen and see what they're typing. Through the touchscreen system, they also have uh, eavesdrop, we call it. They can listen to any conversation anywhere in the room. This is sometimes very, very useful if somebody is telephoning in a panic and it's very difficult to understand because they're screaming. Um, then lots of ears listening can sometimes glean a piece of information rather than a single operator being responsible for trying to interpret what's going on. And then finally, at the extreme left, the screen there is uh, showing that actually at the time this picture was taken, they weren't very busy because there's only one bar at the top, one incident going on, which is probably something like a fire alarm test or something because they don't let you in to take photographs if they're busy. Let's talk a little bit about the mobilising process, the mobilising system that we are still using um, and which joined the brigade at the same time as I did. And it's based on Motorola system, um, Motorola GPT. And it is machine code throughout. It has no high-level language. All bits and bytes. That gives it tremendous speed. But you also need a great deal of expertise uh, to work it. I, I, I'm echoing a little bit late if I say it. <laughs> um, it does do a grand job, and as it stands at the moment, it is street based with a small number of few tens of thousands of known properties, things like uh, industrial sites and properties with uh, high value are listed in the system. But in general, it is based on streets. So, someone picks up the phone and they dial 999. The first person they speak to is the BT operator. The BT operator asks which service you require. Fire Brigade is on the options list. They put a call through to our control and it's picked up within three seconds maximum. The actual average is two seconds. And the BT operator then briefly introduces the caller. As soon as the caller is switched through, our operator says, Fire Service, what's your emergency? And that's when the process begins. Because uh, while she's saying that, she's putting up a new screen on the mobilizing system. It can hold several stacked screens, several things going on at once. And she starts to fill in those details. The most important thing, clearly, is the address. So if somebody says there's a fire in the high street, we have a small problem. <clears throat> because there are at least 35, maybe 40 high streets in East Sussex. So it's really quite important that we find out which town it is as well to give us some idea of where we're going. But once that information is started to be typed, so as soon as she starts to type, the system is narrowing the field. So that by the time that she has got the best part of an address into the system, on the right hand side of her screen, she is being offered a number of addresses. And it's not unusual for the operator to actually interrupt the caller and say, is that, and read the correct address back to them, uh, because the system has identified it that quickly. Average time, one second, to identify a street in East Sussex, uh, one of those uh, 10,350. Once the address is confirmed, we then kick into a lot more information and the next slide starts to show you the sort of information we use to build together the decision to as to what to send. Let me just get my crew page up because it's facts and truth on my crew page. This 
This is a two part, and uh, there's the bottom of the diagram, there's the top of the, top of the diagram. I couldn't possibly squash it all onto one slide and make it anywhere near readable, so that's why I've split it. On the right hand side, there's a section I've labelled static data. The things that don't change, the things that we know, and are factors that build into the system. So we have a, a premises list. As I've said, the current system has a number of known premises. We have streets, and all are referenced by a national grid reference. Now in the current system, that's an eight figure national grid reference. So, uh, not so good. On the new system, which we'll I'll talk about in a second, that will be a 12 figure national grid reference. In other words, we can go to within the meter of the centre of that location. We know exactly where we're going to. Um, if the premises is known to us, then we may well have known requirements for that premises. We call it a PDA, a predetermined attendance. So we know it's a tall building, we know we're going to need to send an aerial. Um, we know that there's a particular hazard, we may send extra appliances right from the worker. Normal attendance is two. If somebody calls up and says, I've been locked out, I've been locked in, I'm stuck in a lift, um, I catch up a tree, we, we send one. <laughs> yeah. We've also got something else now, which is uh, fairly recent the challenge. We receive a lot of calls which are false alarms. 42% of the calls we receive are false alarms. And although, thankfully, the majority are what we call false alarms with intent, in other words, they really did think it was a or that we were required. There's only very few, I'm pleased to say, false alarm malicious. And we're getting better at those, as I'll explain in a second. Um, so, there may be a predetermined attendance because of known requirements or known hazards, which is listed up there in that top box. So, we know it's a chemical plant, we know we're going to need extra facility. Then, below that little box there says point to point travel times. We know how long, on average, it takes to drive from every road junction to every other road junction in the county. That's not a bad database, that's quite, quite tricky. Um, and it can work out the shortest route, and therefore from the fire station to the fire. And therefore, who is going to get there first? Now if we backtrack to here, those coastal stations, the whole type stations, have one minute to get out the door. Because they're there. They're right beside their appliances. Um, they all pile out the door and all you see is boots and pens. Because they, they walk around the station all the time with their shoelaces undone, just in case you go to the fire station. It's normal because they can get their shoes off quickly then and jump into their boots, which already have their leggings right around them. So they jump into the boots, pull the leggings up and they're half-dressed. Put, put on the jacket. Okay. They have to be dressed before they get in the appliance. That rule was changed when the young firefighter wasn't, got in, was still trying to sort himself out, the door swung open and he fell from the appliance. And he was quite badly injured. So now that's it. A little bit of extra time is taken. You are fully dressed before you get in the appliance. So, one minute for those. Also, for the day crew stations during the daytime, that's another one minute turn. The retained, as I've said, is a five minute turn. So, the day crew stations, when the crew go home at six, their turnout time changes from one minute to five minutes. And the whole map of the county, in terms of who will get there first, changes by that difference in time. If you apply that strictly, it usually means that Barkham don't get any fire calls at all, if Lewis are there. But 
but that's been adjusted. So far from we're okay with this work. So back to where I was. We know about adjacent brigades availability, their contact details and where their stations are. <coughs> it is possible that we will immediately ask one of our neighbours to send an appliance. We'll send one and get them to send one. So places around the edge. We have details on everything that is within, within an extra 10% of our border. Um, and so there may well be an attendance by two brigades at one instant if they happen to be on the edge of the county. And then we also have details of assistance services, police, ambulance, uh, rescue, the vehicle rescue services, and so on. And Coast Guard, because at New Haven, we also have a maritime team whose job it is to jump on uh, the uh, fishery protection vessel there and go and have a look at anything that may be in light at sea. So just a little extra thing that we can do. At Bex Hill, we have the rope rescue team, specialists in gangling off buildings, usually rescuing seagulls. But um, <laughs> uh, they are specialists with, with, with rope and tackle, and uh, they, they're located there. And Perhaps one of the busiest teams of all, uh, up at Cobra, uh, we have the, the animal rescue team. And we rescue a lot of animals uh, from ditches and, and so on and collapses. Um, one of the most heartening things to see is our, is our weekly bulletin, which comes around the brigade with all the thank you letters from people where we have rescued their, their pet horse. A lot of horses in Sussex do some very silly things. <laughs> so, okay, our static data. Now, on the, on the other side of the picture, here we are, our dynamic data. But we know about the caller, and we have something called CLI, caller line identification. This means that we actually know where the phone is that you are calling from. This then harks back to the problem of uh, false alarm malicious. And school children are on summer holiday and think it would be funny to fire the phone brigade from a phone box miles away from where they say the fire is. And we can tell that they're miles away from where the fire is. So we challenge. We challenge automatic fire alarms from uh, companies, from fire alarm companies, if there is somebody on the site. So we phone the site concern and say, is there a fire? And 99 times out of 100, there is not. As long as they are what is called a responsible person, um, then we, we say, okay, well, we won't come. If we can't talk to anybody, we go anyway. And the general rule is we go anyway. So, call of line identification has another nice feature in that it identifies your mobile phone, should you decide phone a hoax call into the fire service and records it. And then we ask the phone company to block the mobile phone. And then the caller phones his mobile phone company and says, my phone stopped working. And they say, yes sir, come to our shop. We will be pleased to arrest you. <laughs> <laughs> so we know where they are. Um, we Glean from them the nature of the incident and uh, the contact method. So, how can we get back to them? Sometimes they cannot stay in the building on the phone, they have to go outside. That sort of thing. So, we, we're sure we need to stay in contact with them. All of that information is fed in uh, and generates in the center an incident type and looks up if there is a predetermined attendance. And using the other information on the left, so who have we got available? That's the first thing. Uh, what's their role? What's their competence? So if we need specialist skills, we know about that. 
where are they? So is the fire engine actually at the fire station or is it already out somewhere else? And uh, how can we communicate? Which communication method are we going to use to get in touch with those people? Now, we are belt, braces, and piece of strings service. So, in order to co connect with every fire station, we have a, pro a private one. That's our main method of contacting the fire station. Uh, should that fail, we then use the PACnet packet transmission service, and we have a PACnet uh, message that we can send. PACnet is used because it is an end-to-end -end service. Uh, if you send a PACnet message, you get back a positive acknowledgement from the other end, because every PACnet pad is a transceiver, it's not just a receiver. It receives the message and sends back that it has got it. Um, and then, uh, if that fails, we also have a good old fashioned method. We phone a pager service with a code number. And in the station end electronics, we have a pager set up with just a pair of contacts, the vibrator contacts and the pager connected with a piece of wire across a couple of contacts in the cabinet. And uh, we just page, and it's still fires off a message that says communications failed, please call control, but it still rings the bells, opens the doors, puts the lights on, and pages all of the firefighters if they uh, alerts all the firefighters to come in. So bell braces and a piece of string. Oh, there. Uh, we do not rely on the telephone network. We do not use mobile phones to alert. There are a number of services who seem to believe that they are covered, they're safe. They can call out all their members by mobile phone. Um, if a disaster happens, the first thing that vanishes is the mobile phone it's actively turned off unless you are a reserved number. Um, so shortly followed by uh, the telephone system snarling up completely and the internet right behind it. So, all of our systems are ours. When we come, oh, sorry, um, when we transmit an alert, the transmission actually goes out from the fire station. So it's not hilltop sites or anything like that. They're our own transmitters on our own sites, connected to our own system. Have one or two problems when people decide to work in totally metal enclosed offices and say my alert never went off. Well, surprise, surprise. But uh, other than that, fairly reliable system. So with all of that data coming together, there in the centre, calculates the list of attendees, the fastest and the best attributed first. So this list is all worked out very, very quickly by the mobilizing system and presented to the operator. Nothing is done by the machine automatically on its own. It does not, it is not allowed to commit. That is done by a person. Yes, I will send them or no, I happen to know something that means that it will take them longer. Little things like the New Haven Screen Bridge don't. Or there are roadworks there which will slow them down and the other lot will get there faster. Or I happen to know they're all on station, so they'll get out quickly. Local knowledge is extremely important, and our control room operators are specialists. Um, quite amazing some of the things they, they know. Um, and their, their actual knowledge of their job is quite something to behold because the adrenaline rush when a nine school comes in, is obvious. So when you're in the control room, the sounder is very, very specific. And I would perhaps be in control room showing visitors around, showing them how the system works. And the nine goes down, I stop speaking mid-sentence immediately in order not to confuse the operators with the 
extraneous noise. Uh, but they cope with some amazing stuff, and there are some great recorded tapes. Because one of the other features of the system is that every communication that enters the control room is recorded on a system called Redbox. That's ours as well, um, and we digitally record every conversation on the telephone and on the radio that comes through the control room. The little old lady in the drought berating the operator about the amount of water we were using for the fires out is an amazing tape to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> the operator was so kind and polite to this nutcase. <laughs> okay. All the data uh, gathered together about the location is passed down here to the GIS system. We have the GIS screens, as you've seen, in the control room, and they are able to show both the location of the fire and the location of the appliances. So as soon as an appliance starts to move, it sends back, using GPS, its location to the system and you can actually see the fire engine getting closer to the fire. You can change scale on the map, we'll talk about map scales shortly, and you can actually watch them going there, even to the point where I have heard some time ago now a control room operator call the crew and say you've just driven past the end of the road. So it's fairly accurate. Um, there are a little box here, could have moved it on the diagram, I suppose, but communication methods available. There are a number of communication methods available, and uh, that feeds into the next slide. Let's have a look at that, because there at the top is the key thing, mobilise. That's the decision made by the mobilisation team, crew, uh, usually in collusion with the supervisor. So generally speaking, an operator will say, it's under OK, the supervisor, yes, and she presses the button. The call goes out to the station, at which point the electronics at the station end take over. Um, special boxes we call coders, made by a company called Monkey take uh, messages in a standard format called GD92. It's stood the test of time. The man who invented it was extremely clever, and nothing about GD92 has been changed in nearly 20 years because the communication protocol is so solid for this job. It was designed for emergency services. And that, those signals are very, very short packets of information interpreted by the coder, and it can do a number of things. First and foremost, on the station, it puts the bells down, as we say. Um, that's a, a very, very long-winded explanation, but once upon a time, a bell was balanced, like all church bells. If you ring them up, they hover at the top. You only have to touch them for them to ring. And the original bells were up, and something released them to fall down. So, putting the bells down. Except that now it's an electronically generated bomb <laughs> with a WAV file voice saying which appliance needs to go when you're on a station with multiple appliances. So, it's still one of those sounds when you're on a station that you know keep out of the way because they're going to come running. And they do still use the, the slippery pole in the two stations. Public aren't allowed to have a go anymore since somebody fell down. So mobilise happens and that communication goes out uh, to the station unless the appliance, the fire engine required, is already out. If it's already out, it knows it's already out, so it doesn't bother. It sends it direct to the appliance. And then the appliance, the screen goes red and a sounder goes off and they know they've got another job. Um, they must be both out driving about and available status. And, uh, so it does that. Um, and the outgoing communication is acknowledged down this side. Um, to do that, there are there is a, a, an acknowledgement then that goes back, and there are more than, there's more than one route um, for, for that. Everything that happens is logged. So over here, 
than the line that's coming from mobilize to log all actions. And every action of the operator, every message recorded, and the voice message will be typed into the system, um, an automatic message from a compliance, which they can do by pressing a button, gets entered into the system. And we have something called the narrative log that attaches to every file call. And it's a very long document that literally details uh, somewhat ridiculously to the nanosecond when that happened. <laughs> uh, for some reason, the people who used the Motorola system, uh, this machine gun service, uh, noticed that the clock was running at nanosecond accuracy. And so they decided, yes, we'll record all the times to the finest detail we can. And so it is. Two decimal places of seconds of the call of the population. Uh, and there's a lot of them. that particular table in the database fills up. And it is all copied to a database. The database uh, is still running from the day it started. Uh, I'm pleased to say it started just after I joined the brigade, literally within weeks. Uh, we were working on a new system and this was in place. Every file call and since then is still in the database available to be looked at. We can do comparisons across a large number of years. So uh, once they get there, then the message comes back to let them know, let the control know that they've arrived. That's from the vehicle system. Um, again, across those same bearers. Um, we're using PacNet to the vehicle. We're also using something called Stream. Uh, let's just check which slide that is. Lo and behold, this is the next slide. So this is communication to the vehicle. Um, and down, uh, sort of bottom left hand corner, you see their Stream communications. It's a GPRS system um, which fires uh, messages to the vehicle. It's clever because it will only accept inf information from registered SIM uh, within the brigade. So no extraneous messages get into that system at all. And Stream is very, very useful because it is agile. It has three telephone people, the telephone system providers available to it. And it will hop to find the best signal. So if it happens to be three cars, Phone phone or uh, it hops about, it finds the best. The cost is a bit more, but very, very effective because Sussex is one of those counties with bumps in, and there are lots of places where uh, a particular provider's uh, signal strength will fall away. But uh, this, this copes. If they are in the fire station, then we actually uh, correspond over uh, our own wireless action, uh, wireless network points. So we have uh, our local Wi Fi uh, for the vehicle to communicate. And uh, in keeping with our policy of having three ways of doing things, we also use PacNet. At the moment, shortly we will be going over to use uh, Airwave. Airwave is the, the, the emergency services system but it has uh, a, a data channel running alongside the voice which is not disturbed by the voice so it's always available and we will be switching over to using airway as our third piece of string uh, it will be the third piece of string because airway is expense every time you send the message they charge an officer in his car leaving his airway radio on and driving to the west country ended up customer Ocean did at that time, thank goodness, it cost him a fortune because every hilltop site he passed saw it coming, woke up, and ding, ding off went the cash with itself again. It's very clever. Notionally, one can grab an airway radio, it just looks like a little handheld, and talk to a police officer in Scotland. It can be done. It's just so, uh, on the vehicle there, bottom right hand corner, uh, I showed you last time the, uh, the Panasonic Toughbook 
which is our mobile data terminal. Tremendously tough and extremely expensive laptop, £2,000 for a laptop uh, that is, to a large extent, firefighter proof. <laughs> you can't be 100% sure on that. They are locked into the vehicles in the carriage, so they can't be stolen. We have had people steal things from the cabs and fire engines whilst the firefighters are out fighting the fire. Um, and uh, connected to those, the bearers are permanently installed in the vehicle. The laptop can be unlocked, removed, and a new one dropped in in moments if something goes wrong. So it gives us a, a service angle that we, we can get to. So there's our, there's our talking to the, talking to the uh, the appliance and receiving information from the appliance. And now if I go back, we're there. We started to work on the file. We've sent back messages about our first impressions. And now we realize it's a bit bigger than we thought and we need more. And so we get into the area of what's called the make pumps message. Very clever, well thought out. Because there is no way of knowing what's already on the way, because the control room may already have sent things. The officer in charge sends a message that says, make pumps and however many you want. So that the control room know how many are already moving and make the number up. And they make them up by choosing appliances from fire stations progressively further and further away from the incident. And as they do that, they also start this process of relocating resources to rebalance the brigade. As those appliances go out to do a job, they're not available in their local area. So, for example, if the Eastbourne pump gets called, um, can't leave Eastbourne without the pump. So they call out the retained people in Pedal to get on their fire engine and drive it to Eastbourne fire station and sit there to cover. And that goes on and on and on. We have had a couple in my career of make parts 24 files. That depletes the brigade significantly to the point where we have had all of West Sussex move over a bit and they've started calling Hampshire in to come on that side. And we've pulled in from Kent and they've started to pull London down. And we've pulled in from Surrey start to spread out again to London and across. It's quite interesting. And then when it's all over, it all unwinds again and we'll go back to where it was. And this is all being controlled by the control room staff, real experts at their job, but by the use of the IT, they can see what's available. They can always get that information. So we've got an awful lot of information flying about in our system. And um, Later, I have a, a slide which sort of illustrates some of the data paths that go on. So that's that's turning out a fire engine. Ever so easy. <laughs> just just you, you just need really top-notch systems, very very capable of doing the job. At our new control room in Hoti, we are due to receive a new uh, mobilising system. It's currently being written by a company called Remstack and they are basing it on Windows. <laughs> Turn the camera off if you will. <coughs> so, let's look at a little bit at the infrastructure. What keeps us together in terms of the brigade itself and everything else working all around the brigade. Um, Key to the whole thing is that top line. Wonderful, isn't it? I talk about the brigade is full of abbreviations, acronyms, and so forth. This is great. Um, MDNX, I have no idea what it stands for, uh, are a service providing company. And uh, last year, late last year, they took over the entire stock of EasyNet. And they now trade as EasyNet. And they have been given the contract of providing the public service network in East Sussex. So the public service network provides uh, connect connectivity to all local government offices uh, in East Sussex. And I think, actually, that the university 
also has a link. Um, when it was being set up, the university offered some of its service space, I believe, um, a little bit uh, to, to, the, to the whole system. So it'd be quite interesting. I, I, it, it may well still exist, I'm not sure. Um, it's an MPLS, uh, a multi protocol label switching network. Uh, instead of a packet running around the network and every time it hits the switch, the switch having to find out where that packet's got to go by looking it up. The MPLS system already knows it is pre labeled with where it's going. And so it knows its way around the route to find its way to where it's going more quickly. Uh, faster network. And uh, in brackets on the end there, uh, the wide area network is IL2 compliant. Um, the, uh, the impact level security scale runs from zero, um, no impact at all, through to six, which I think is a half a country destroyed. It's, uh, it's a fairly wide ranging uh, system. But um, IO2 is likely to have a cost implication up to a million pounds if something goes wrong, if your data escapes. So, We'll be very careful with our data. We hold a lot of data about other places, including this vulner the vulnerabilities of various premises. And so it's not a good idea for that to escape. We also know where fires have been. We don't want that out either. So uh, IO2 is an appropriate level for us. In our network centre, which is located at our headquarters in Eastbourne. Um, we, we now have over 50 HP blade servers. Blade servers themselves are quite civilized price, but the racks they go in are astronomical. Blade servers are about 350 pounds, the rack is 40,000. <laughs> <laughs> because all the power supplies and balancing utility. Blade is just a thing, it doesn't cover a couple of processes. But uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, to support that, to, to store all their data, and we are now well over the two terabytes of uh, just day to day storage already, uh, we have 250 plus hard drives in uh, uh, an EVO array. Um, resilient, if a, if a hard drive packs up, just put it, plug another one in, and the system rebalances itself and puts data back on that drive. And carries on as if nothing had happened. Um, the drives, interestingly, are much more expensive than the ones you and I buy for our home PC. Drives are about 350 pounds a time. Just for, just for a hard drive. We have 48 Cisco switches in our system all over the brigade. Um, a, a couple of really high power main ones, obviously, in the, in the, uh, in the network centre, but the, 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 the remainder are out around the system. We've got to see a diagram about loading that. Um, and 26 routers in various places to, uh, to route all this traffic. Uh, the six-storey building that we occupy at least well, used to be quite a patient's plan. Um, when we moved in, it was already pre-wired with a huge amount of socketry uh, for network. All white cables with no labels. <laughs> Our contractors uh, went into it with an axe, tore it all out, and put new covers in. And so we knew where we were. Uh, the floors, because it's a three phase building, the floors are linked by fiber optics. Because if you electrically link floors which are on different phases, you've got a potential difference of 400 volts, which is not a good idea for most IT or people for that matter. Um, so uh, the fibre backbone runs up through the building. And we also have this enormous number of UPSs. We're a service that needs to keep going. Um, little story coming shortly, but keep them going. <laughs> uh, we have at the Eastbourne headquarters a UPS for the entire building. It will keep the entire building going for half an hour. We also have two generators. So what actually happens is UPS takes over instantly, 
without anybody noticing the joint, but they noticed the joint when the diesel generator goes boom, and an enormous black cloud wipes up the side of the building. But uh, the UPS is there. Uh, that network centre has also got a gas quench system. Should we have a fire, it releases, I think it's about eight man high cylinders of quench gas into the room. Damn out any fire. They say it's not poisonous, <laughs> just can't <I> breathe. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, it went off once by accident. Yeah. And the poor lady cleaning it in the corridor outside thought the end of the world would come. Because it goes with quite a bang, to say the least. Um, and then on every fire station, we have an omnitrope for power supply to supply all of the IT equipment and the cabinet, which contains the coder that can turn the So that's our belt and braces. In some stations, we also have a set of pair of batteries, just in case. Because the actual coder runs on 24 volts. 12 volt batteries will keep that going for a good hour and a half. So uh, we, we, we make sure. So that's a, a bit about the infrastructure. Um, this bigger and better WAN, the new WAN is there. It's a gigabyte ring around East Sussex to all the whole time stations and to the new control centre of PC. Um, there's a cross country link for resilience across diagonally across the ring. And uh, all the retained and day crew stations have 100 megabits of space. And we used to use Citrix, don't know if anybody's familiar, a terminal, a very fairly dumb terminal. But the great thing about the Citrix terminals well, that they could work back to a server at headquarters which did all the work and only screen pixel changes and mouse clicks and key clicks went to and fro. For most computers, as you're aware, key clicks and mouse clicks are thousands of instructions apart. People are very slow compared to computers, so the occupancy of the, of the then available um, network connections wasn't particularly badly hit by Citrix servers. In fact, the biggest hit on those connections was the Cisco voice over IP phone. Now people have a conversation, your computer slow down. It's always had priority. We've improved on that a little. So here we go. <laughs> the big ring in the middle is the ring around all the stations, <coughs> main stations. And then all of the spurs that we see out to all of the other stations, all the way around. And there is now uh, an extra entry in that ring, uh, the, the new control room at Hope and Heath. I'm not allowed to show you that picture because it's commercially confident, confidential uh, by the people who installed it, the confidential X. Um, so I can only you show you what it was like just before. <laughs> and that's that's how we managed to talk to ourselves around random circles. If one part of the ring breaks, then the signal can go around the ring the other way uh, to get to its final destination. It means that we've been able to take out from the fire stations all of the Citrix terminals and give them back PCs. And those stations that used to have servers of their own, we've taken those out as well. And all of their data is now back at headquarters in a single uh, computer link. And nobody's uh, complained at all because it's actually much better. PCs are better. We control our PCs quite a lot, we tie them down uh, with a system called MCM, which means that we can control what they can do on the PC. When you hit the start button on your Windows PC, quite a lot of the menu items you're used to at home are no longer there to save people from bending the machines, nor do normal users have any access to their C drive. Um, they record everything onto the server. So that uh, we don't have any problem if a machine goes down, we can pull it out, drop another one in without losing any data. Because the machine, once in its location, we tell it where it is, and the system, ZCM, loads all the software that's appropriate for that machine in that location and that user. 
but if you log on and the machine is checked, you get all the machine for every day. It's really quite neat. It would be even better if ZCM was perfect, it's not. And, and so a lot of our support is uh, maintaining ZCM. And that has caused us the problem uh, with, with moving on as, as I'll come to. So some of the systems that we're using, we are still using Novell Directory. Yeah. Um, literally because moving away from it is very hard work. But yes, we're still using Directory. It does work in that uh, we can control everybody's access using it. But uh, it's now getting rare to say the least. And finding Nobel skilled engineers <coughs> even rarer. And that's a bit of a problem. We have, however, taken on board Microsoft CRM. It came to us with all sorts of promise. Uh, but I quickly realized that Microsoft CRM is an empty shell until you tell it what to do. And uh, technical fire safety is uh, a big concern. Technical fire safety is about businesses. You may be aware of uh, the change in Fire Services Act, uh, whereby business owners are now responsible for fire safety in their buildings. Completely responsible. We will advise, that's no problem, and if we come along and inspect and you're doing it wrong, we will take you to court. But we don't tell you how to do it. And that change in the law means that we now have to be aware of what provisions are being made by individuals to their standard. So instead of us going in and saying this, 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 and this, they are allowed to say, well, I've done it like this. Um, and sometimes they get it wrong and we advise them. Well, we start with advice. <laughs> If they ignore our advice, we take them to court, and thankfully the fines are very high, and we publish every time. So when the supermarket persistently blocks the exit with trolleys, um, we make sure they get publicised. Technical fire safety then a lot of information about all the businesses in Kenton, and at the moment that's in a Microsoft CRM system. We're expanding that into community fire safety, which is where we look after our vulnerable people. And you may be aware of some of our community fire safety activity. Uh, we send out teams to vulnerable people to advise them on their home fire safety provision and to fit free smoke alarms if applicable. Um, and again, a big pile of thank you letters from people who uh, always, always. However, there's an awful lot of elderly people in East Sussex. And so the records have to be very carefully kept. We're also running there into uh, some of the information about data protection because we have to destroy it after a certain amount of time because it's no longer relevant. We have been on occasion attend an estate where our information centre was not of elderly people, but the data based on the census years ago, it's so old, but by now they've all died and moved away and it's all for the young people with different problems. So we a bit careful. Um, Infographics company make a, a product called Firewatch. Uh, it was actually written for fire services, which is unusual, because the fire service market, when you think about it, is really quite small. There are only 42 brigades in the country. Um, but they produced a purpose-built system, which has a number of modules. And the primary ones we've taken our HR training. Um, and they also supply the crewing information uh, to the mobilising system. So it knows who is available to crew the fire. Um, just spoken about the Sussex PSN, the link project. And the first thing that happened for us was voice. Uh, the uh, IP voice we were already using. Voice over IP uh, with our own system and Cisco phones. Um, they uh, have uh, a 
Copy two. Can't possibly, uh, quite possible. See, it's up to me. And a very successful project. I'm swinging this over. A company called KCOM. From this over to what's over IP. That quarter plus four is up to me. All of the fun from the brigade proceeds. A little bit of consternation in some places. On the switchboard. And so on. And thankfully, the 9999s were not purchased. They come in direct. Uh, on some of the other floors, it, it was well, of course, four, let's go home. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, within 15 minutes, uh, NDNX had replaced the piece of equipment, which was causing the problem. It wasn't Cape Cod's fault, it was NDNX's. And uh, we were back on the phones, relaunched themselves. You can do a lot with IP phone, it's just a very handy system. We now have something uh, which I'll come to. Called Jabba. And we replaced ISDN lines uh, with one voice uh, SIP trunking. So, our desktop. Well, our desktop, we've got 600 of them. 600 desktop PCs. We also need all the Citrix terminals. Um, they are in a stack in the storeroom. Uh, we have Wi-Fi throughout the organisation, uh, throughout our buildings, uh, everywhere we have. There are 260 laptops out there, mostly officers going doing fire safety work, and uh, 35 white pads. Just guess who's got the iPad? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, we can network print securely to any printer in the organisation. So from my computer, I can send a print into the system and it sits in the system until I go to a printer anywhere and ask for it. Which is really, really handy. Because literally you can send prints to people without having to send it to the phone. But on top of that, we've also got printers on all of the vehicles, the appliances. And several specialist printers, uh, including a huge plotter for planes and that sort of thing. So we've got an estate of more than 200 printers across the organisation. And here we go the, the KCOM, Cisco, RIP, Cisco telephones uh, across the Sussex Bank with Java. Java is a PC application and will do away with the phone handset for those people for whom it's appropriate because. You can connect a microphone and headset to your PC, and the Java system will detect, because it's all IP voice, will detect a call coming in and will direct it to your, you can take the call on your PC or any PC. And Java has a wonderful follow me system which will find you wherever you are. So it brings your desk phone if you don't have, so it tries a PC. If you don't know through it brings you over. Um, you can't get away. Jab <laughs> uh, also records uh, uh, voicemail messages and plays them back as web files uh, and records uh, and keeps a record of every call you make or receive. So calling back is dead easy, you just find it, just click it, and it makes a call. It also pops up a little window on the screen every time. Your phone rings in synchronization with your phone rings, and it's a bit of a mistake to click on the close button, which I've done a couple of times because it cuts the call off. <laughs> <laughs> we are learning, <laughs> we are learning, but very successfully, as I say, until four past four, but I've fixed it within 15 minutes. So not bad. Uh, talk about some of the source information now. Yeah. Mapping uh, we get our maps all from Organ Server. There is something called the Mapping Services Agreement, which uh, supplies all local government organisations with maps from all the survey for free. No doubt, we are all paying for that in the taxes. Um, but it means that we can obtain any scale of map and type of map as available uh, direct from all the survey without any problems. We use uh, the top lot, all, uh, all except the bottom one. 
So uh, at various scales, we have tiles, effectively pictures, raster images of maps that we can use as a background to plot on. So, um, master map, which is actually uh, 1500 gazillion vector polygon files, and ITN, uh, the uh, Integrated Transport Network information, so all the roads uh, and rail and shipping uh, <coughs> are all on. Street gear, um, if you want people to see, uh, and then the scales, 10,000, 50,000, 50,000, um, as, as vectors. And then the, the new one at the bottom, uh, the OS have just generated uh, something called the OS Vector Map Local, which is available as a raster image uh, or as a vector. Um, and as a vector, it's very, very good because that shows that to individual premises and will show your greenhouse. It's quite good. Five, five minutes. Okay, fine. Yep. Gazetteer, um, formerly based on path and address point, has now been superseded by the National Land Property Gazetteer, Local Land and Property Gazetteer, and we have a custodian in each of our six farms uh, who control what goes on to that list as premises. We have found a few for them. Um, they're very interested because if it's taxable, they want to know. That comes to us now in something called address space. It's replaced it. And we manage it in something called uh, aligned assets. And this is an illustration of, of one of our applications. Um, it's effectively stand, what used to be called standards of fire cover. And uh, they've now carefully renamed it. It's now called FSEC, <laughs> Fire Service Emergency Cover. But uh, green, below average risk of fire. Blue, I'm oh sorry, green is well below. Blue is below average. Yellow is average. Orange is above average. And red is well above average. Which you can see we've got a couple of. But then right. So uh, in the middle there, it's density of housing, which is caused the, the risk. Um, and out on the, on the wing there, just above South Wing, is the age of the residents. And all of those factors are pulled in to, to decide. And you'll see the, the factors in a second. So here we go, the data relationships that we use, this is about uh, just under a quarter of the full diagram we'll be able to see. So there's our mobilizing system that needs information in order to be able to put the fire in detail. It gets some from the gas team, obviously, the addresses. And uh, it gets the locations GIS system, which also feeds into the gazetteer, so the gazetteer knows exactly where a premises is. That's a two-way link to mobilisation, because mobilisation also displays what it knows on the GIS. Address base feeds the gazetteer, and ordinary survey gives the maps. Over here, we need to know the crew, who's available. The rotors of officers and who's available for fire policy. So that feeds into the mobilizing system, as do their skills. And those two are covered by the Firewatch HR package, which uh, stores and generates that information. The gazetteer, the GIS, and the crewing rotors, together with risk analysis, all go into this FSEC package to give you those coloured areas on the map. And FSEC itself then feeds into the mobilising system to say, this is what you need to send because of the risk level. Mobilising feeds out information about the calls and everything that is recorded into a system called the IRS, the Electronic Instrument Recording System, which is a Home Office, uh, sorry, DCLG package, Department of Communities and Local collect all of their data from all the fire services on a, a, a minimum of a monthly basis. Some fire services do it daily. Um, and 
We also store it in our own management information system database. So we take all of that information in, and the two packages talk to each other as well. They're all actually in the same database. MIS also feeds information into the SM of past calls so that you know what you've attended in the past. And mobilization and risks feed the mobile data terminals on the vehicle. Together with information about where all the hydrants are, and the hydrant information also feeds into the GIS so that mobilizing knows where the active hydrants are. So when you turn up at a call, the icons on the map tell you which hydrants are working and which are full. There's a lot of hydrants. We also have a CAD uh, package and CAD department who feed uh, drawings into mobile data terminals. So that when you turn up in a big place, you've got a drawing of all the floors. So if you know what you're attending. Very interesting one for Furl Place, which has uh, diagrams of which painting to go and cut out the frame and roll up and roll out. Because it's worth more than building. We also take a, a, a package called Ken Data. All chemicals being carried in bulk, as you know, have a, a flag on a number, um, and chemicals should all be labelled with their name, and a crew can uh, look up on that mobile data terminal what to do about a particular chemical, whether it's safe to put water on it, or what other treatments going to happen. But you've all got to put on gas tight suits to deal with it. And also vehicle data. Every vehicle that's manufactured has uh, special considerations in terms of fire. One of the most, one of the earliest ones was gas struts on hatchbacks. Because if, if the gas strut gets hot, Gas pressure in the gas strut rises. And firefighters are attempting to open the boot to get a hose in the water. And it was thrown a long way by the enormous pressure in the gas strut. Fetching, as soon as you release the catch, it fetched the, the boot up underneath it and pushed it away. Um, be a bit careful. And BMWs have uh, seals in their injector system which, when heated, are poisonous by skin contact. So little things like that are useful to know. And so vehicle data is also available on that So that's, as I say, put the pluses on. That's a little bit of the diagram and shows you how data thrashes around our system. And we have to keep an eye on it. It's great fun. And just here we go. These are a few of the things. We work with. Sorry to hurry you, Steve, but we have to be out of the building in what, about I, 10 minutes. I think, I I think, think we summarise. I, I think, think we might go to take a couple of quick questions. Yeah, absolutely. I think actually we'd be very That's very good. It is. I'm sorry, the bike. I'm in there. Okay. 80% reduction in the fire service budget from the government. So the potential is there for us to outsource a huge amount of that stuff. The risk is being able to deliver the service level agreement. At the moment, if something goes wrong, we can get a technician anywhere in the county in two hours maximum, usually within an hour. If that's outsourced four hours, four days, so it's a risk. But that's been your turn. Much more in terms of off-site cloud-based applications and storage, providing we can provide find providers who are uh, uh, who do have the correct accreditation in terms of security. And mobile working even to the desktop. We are going to we are even looking at uh, doing away with desktop PC size and just giving everybody a laptop. They're quite as powerful now, no great problem. You, wherever you sit is your office. <coughs> and so, uh, smaller everywhere. Much more greater collaboration between people in the public sector and the county.
county wide way it will start and smaller teams smaller offices so more to do fewer people to do it thank you thanks very much